Thank you, Theo. Uh, as you can see, it's already looking fairly bare up there. It's, it's pretty white with a bit of black text. It's the way I'm, I'd like to present this. I'm not actually going to present any slides. I'm just going to talk. Uh, because I think, I felt coming to a music conference is obviously a big step for me. I'm an anthropologist by training. I, I was asked to set up a San Heritage Center. Um, so stepping into a new space is a point of, I think, vulnerability. Um, I really admire Theo, and I'm extremely grateful for being asked into this space. And just the uh, presentations that I've managed to see so far, it really reminds me how much we can gain from making those steps. And I think it's something that is so valuable and it's so very hard to do. And I've prepared something here, and if there is something naive in it, which I'm sure there will be, uh, there's something ignorant in it, which I think there will also be, then I think that's almost part of the process that we have to go through. We have to be brave enough to step up and say, look, I'm coming into somewhere, I know nothing about your, your work and your space. I mean, I'm a, the closest is I'm an amateur musician. Um, we have to give that vulnerability, that space, for it to be filled again. Uh, and there's an element of trust involved in that. And I th hope that that's, that's kind of where I lead through in, into the talk about where we take archives going forwards. I, I should briefly probably just say for people who, I, I think everyone's probably familiar with Hassan, but so 130,000 people, they could be called the first people of Southern Africa. Their genetic history traces back 350,000 years to the origins of humankind. So a very interesting space in Southern Africa. Uh, and I've, I've been working with the San for um, something like 23 years now. So it gives me great pleasure to experience the music and conversation of this conference. And it's very apparent to me that, you know, and perhaps it's not surprising, uh, a music conference, there's, there's good energy and there's real enthusiasm. And energy and enthusiasm, that's almost my starting point. So energy is obviously critical to something, bowed electrons, something musical, the deliberate excitation and modulated control of particles to achieve something. And then enthusiasm, an intensity of feeling in favour of a particular cause. Enthusiasm was a term that was used uh, hundreds of years ago for poetry, to give something life and move it forwards. Uh, and there's enthusiasm in music in that uh, spaces we fill with music. So I just want to stop here, just as we're getting started on the focus of the discussion, which is about archives, to reflect a little on what music is or one particular way of thinking about musical performance. And obviously, I'm doing this to uh, professional musicians and um, students of music and so forth. So again, vulnerability, ignorance. But for me, it's something done to bring about a change in oneself, in others, or simultaneously in both. For years, I've focused on healing amongst the Khoi Khoi and San. And it strikes me that music is like medicine, in the sense that it is a potent way of acting in the world that is used to change the state of oneself, being the musician, or others, and arguably both. Like medicines, thought of in the sense of both good medicine and bad medicine, or the relationship of medicine to poison. It's something that can have multiple powers to change a person. It can be a tonic, something that wakes you up, it calms you down, it gets you feeling right. It can even upset you if the dose is wrong or the content is not harmonious. Music also holds interesting parallels to perfume, something I've written a lot about. The San and people across the world use perfume on themselves to give themselves some effect or influence or impact on others. The historical Tkham San who lived in the Northern Cape region, used buchu in, the, in this sort of way to calm and soothe the dangerous rain. It was a perfume sprinkle to stop uh, the lightning striking young maidens. San also used perfume or strong smelling substances on themselves to make them feel different. 
The globalized perfume trade focuses on perfume used in similar ways to make a person feel and hence be more attractive or more sophisticated. Amongst the San, this is framed differently, more openly as deliberate use of perfume as something that has the power to draw people to you. Uh, I had a translator who used to say when she put her sa perfume on that it would get the boys running. And there was humour in it, and it could be cast off as a casual statement, but there's a real sense of almost magnetism in there. It's something that you do that it, it's right for a person to wear this, to work properly in the world. It's good to wear. It's something that fits in your world. Alternatively, the San might also use strong-smelling plants to wake themselves up, like a snuff. They do this with sa, the powder of certain plants, carried to help a person if they're lost, to get their senses back. Or really strong-smelling parts of animals might be used to open up a healer in a dance, or make a child strong. The anal glands of the aardwolf or polecat are used in this manner. Now, this is reminent, reminiscent of castorium, the foul-smelling secretion from around the, anal, the anus of beavers that's used in the perfume industry. And I believe Chanel No. 5 has beaver anal um, extract included. Uh, so this use of perfume is based on the idea that smell carries the potency and qualities of the source from which it comes. And these can enter a person and give them the same qualities. It sets up something like a kinship relationship between the source and the receiver. Perfume represents the smell of someone or something, or its wind. To use perfume is therefore to work with the wind, a penetrating potency. The San talk of wind and smell as a basis of how medicines work. A San healer will rub their own sweat on someone to give them their healing strength, their wind. Wind carries the strength of animals. Winds carry the ancestors that go into people and make them sick or strong. Wind potency can be good or bad, spontaneous or intentional. My wind can enter you and be good or bad for you. If I have bad thoughts and intentions, these can travel into you via my wind or my wind words, or even by a glance or by pointing which fires invisible potent arrows. And in the San, amongst the San, the idea of wind intersects very closely with invisible arrows. It's a force that moves into you, and they use arrows as a way of thinking about something, entering someone, carrying potency, particularly because they, they're renowned for their poisoned arrows. So something goes inside someone, and it sits inside them, and it works inside them. So music holds some really interesting parallels here. Although I've not heard the San talk of it this way, music is another wind potency, a potent connection with oneself, others, and the wider world. God gives the original wind, the breath of life, and God makes a person who they are. He, and amongst the San, God is he, gives a person their personality, the qualities, skills, and gifts that enable them to do what they do, like playing music. As they proceed through life, they might also be given further gifts, the thoughts and feelings that come to them. Similarly, songs and melodies come to them, and they play them and they share them. Music is therefore a type of wind. It's a potency generated by a person. It's like a person using their God-given gift of wind-making to change how they feel. It can flow into others to change how they feel. And remember, the feeling is everything. I can feel well or sick independently of how long I have to live. How I feel influences what I think and what I do at a critical, fundamental level. Think of the different results between a lazy person and an expert hunter or gardener who's out there in life giving it everything they have. We mix and we mingle our winds. We work with our winds. The first thing a hunter does is check the wind and all day he's working with that wind. If the wind is skittish, children and animals are skittish. We feel different. And it's wind that carries the, our ancestors. The whirlwind carries dangerous dead people, and ancestors come as wind, spirit things around the healing fire to cause and cure sickness. 
Music is a wind, a medicine, a perfume, a gift, a thing that connects and makes things happen. It's not an add-on to life and to ways of living that can carry on perfectly well without it. Music is part of the web that makes life possible. Small communities living together as hunter-gatherers are entirely dependent on each other. It's a community of dissipated knowledge and skills that must work together for everyone to survive. In such a context, how people feel, or their mood, is everything. If one individual keeps upsetting another, fights break out, and the flash of a poisoned arrow could kill the best hunter in an instant, or if a woman constantly rushes out and eats all the best berries herself, tensions will soon erupt and gathering for everyone could stop happening. Then people get angry and they get careless. Maybe you refuse in your anger to go and get the firewood. You don't behave properly. Maybe it's now too late for you to get that firewood. Maybe tonight is the night when the lions come. Maybe there's a new sickness and you must ask the ancestors how to treat it. And you're given a dream of galloping giraffes in the night. There's a famous story in uh, Bushman anthropology about a dream that a lady called B had, or Bay. And she had this dream of giraffe running across the landscape, the thumping of their hooves. And it reminded her of the rain and the thunder. And it was a dream given by God. And the dream came into her, and it was a song. And she realized this was a song that she must share with the people, and it's a healing song. And she shared it, and the healers danced the giraffe dance. And from then on, the giraffe dance has been the primary dance of the Zhenhuanzi. So if a San lady is sitting alone, and melancholy is building, she's drawn into a group where they sit or stand together, and they sing and they play at the same time. Perhaps if she's got enough energy, they'll throw a melon around. They call it the melon dance. Or perhaps if she's a little, a little more depressed, a little darker, they'll sit in a circle and they'll pass around a gourd filled with seeds. That they rub and they rattle and they sing as they hand it round. Men sing special things when they scrape a hide of skin, things that help them do it nicely. Men make poisoned arrows, and while they're making them, they cannot talk. It will distract them. They've got to sit alone, but as they're sitting, they may sing, sing to themselves, singing to themselves to make them do it nicely, to be fully awake, to be aware and attentive. If tomorrow is a big day for hunting eland, men and women may gather and hold an eland dance. They could hold any dance. It could be a kudu dance, a springbok dance. The women will clap and sing whilst the hunters will dance in the fashion of the animal, like an eland doing very different things. Things that they know eland do, but things that eland don't regularly do, not just walking. By doing these things, they know the eland of tomorrow will behave like they've been behaving. They'll be confused and they'll be able to make their kill an easy hunt. If a hunter's not dancing to confuse the eland, he might be lying on his back playing a bow held vertically in his mouth. In his head, he's doing the dance. He's feeling where the eland will be and confusing the eland with his thoughts and feelings. Some San hold puberty rituals where the youths are inducted into adulthood. Needless to say, learning special songs and dances is a critical part of the transition. Now, the San don't typically go through transformations of the body. They don't have circumcision, for instance. Uh, but the transition is in their heads, it's in their minds, and it's in their skill. A person who's gone through a dance, which is commonly called the choma, they'll come out the other side feeling different. They all have new skills and new knowledge, but they feel different. And other people will feel they are different and treat them differently. Perhaps most famously of all, amongst the San, if there's a problem in the community, then they'll hold a healing dance. The dance can be held for an individual who is sick, for a group of people that are sick, or a camp that is unhappy when there's no harmony in the camp. So they sit down and the women sit and they clap and they sing and the healers dance around them and they draw down healing energy. They wake it up inside them and they share it with the community. They share around the circle. 
bringing the people back together. And the music is opening and binding at the same time. As we play an instrument or sing our own instrument, we're setting up a cycle of modulation within, within ourselves and, if others are there, with others. We're entangled in the generation of communal mood, drawing together our deepest feelings with our sound palettes, universal and local. We're in communication with ourselves and with others to change mood, to ripple our beings into different states. We're working with information and inspiration. Among the San, music connects people with themselves, with others and with their environment. Music opens people up so that they can talk with the ancestors, so that they can receive knowledge. In a globalised world, music still plays the sorts of roles that we can see more plainly among the San, but it doesn't have the critical presence it holds among hunter-gatherer San and others from small-scale oral societies who live life in the open. Music among the San is entangled into their ontology of wind and God and flowing potency, into the creation and transmission of knowledge, into the connection between themselves and between their world, visible and invisible. It's about identity and belonging at the most profound and fundamental levels. It's not something heard in the lift or simply a nice pastime, although it could also be. So now I'd like to just reflect on the archive. It's an interesting idea that a recording of music can capture it and preserve it. And that's what a sound archive is all about. So three words that come to me with archive. Preservation. Preservation being keeping it safe before it disappears. To capture music before it degenerates to hold it safe, to stop something decaying. The role of the archive sounds like the claims of early ethnographers that wanted to record and preserve Bushman ideas, beliefs and knowledge before it disappeared forever. And I'm thinking in particular of Blake and Lloyd who recorded language, beliefs and ideas of the now extinct Cape Ham. Their archive has some extraordinary detail and as a colonial exercise, it stands out for its humanity but even their endeavours were not straightforward. These words, preservation and degeneration, raise suspicions. Preservation reminds me of the plans from around 1900 to put Bushmen into a reserve around where the uh, Khalahadi Transfrontier Park now is. They were going to be in there alongside the animals as a place where they could stay wild. Associations with degeneration are reminiscent of the big Christian colonial ideas regarding whether natives, like the Bushmen, were fallen and degenerate and could be saved and brought up. Alternatively, some believed that Bushmen were not actually fully human at all and never had been, hence nothing could lift them. And if, as some farmers conveniently believed, they were not human, then they could be removed from the land like other vermin. Over recent years, museums have come into the limelight as the essence of coloniality. Museums being a key way in which the interwoven sets of ideas that underpinned colonialism work themselves out into the world, both reflecting and reinforcing colonialism. As the academic Siraj Rasool points out, whilst the violence and unequal power relations that lie behind so much museum material, the physical stuff in museums, is well recognised, Audio archives seem to have escaped the net. Rasul stresses that making audio archives in colonial times was a process that sat within the wider abusive colonial programs. He zooms in on the work of Rudolf Perch to make his point. In 1908, Perch undertook a major expedition to parts of Botswana and Namibia and made some exceptional recordings of Naro San voices and music that, they were later, that were later submitted to the phonogram archive of the Australian Academy of Science in Vienna. While some scholars have celebrated the pioneering work of Perch and the archive institution makes claims of benevolent stewardship, Rasul reminds us, reminds us that Perch's expedition generated 67 phonogram recordings, 1,000 metres of film and 2,000 photographs 
1,500 letters, 30 parcels, and 100 boxes. In these boxes and parcels were 150 skulls, 80 skeletons, and two corpses. Immediately after Perk left Africa, the human remains and rock engravings he acquired became the subject of a legal inquiry. Even then, he was doing criminal things. In the light of such behaviour, what is the responsibility of the Vienna archive and others like it? At the very least, it must highlight the context in which this pioneering work was undertaken. Should it then consider restitution? Or what about some sort of co-curated exhibition? Can it claim that it is acting as a responsible steward for future generations? This has been the claim of the British Museum, yet only in the last few weeks it was revealed that something like 2,000 objects have been flowing out of the museum for years and being sold on eBay, among other outlets. And the British Museum had no idea about this, so much for stewardship. And are not these claims of stewardship the echoes of benign or uplifting colonization, the salvation from degeneration? Aren't they just neo-colonial articulations of unequal power relations that continue to replicate the things of the past? Rasul quotes Dan Hicks, museums as the weaponry of death. Rasul reviews some attempts of major European museums to respond to the colonial critique, ranging from a simple telling of the colonial account to the emphasis of provenance, to partnership with source communities and methods of co-curatorship and object sharing. To his mind, this amounts, however, to nothing more than neo-colonial embellishment. Museums cannot hide behind explorations in entanglement and proclamations of stewardship. Rasul argues, alternatively, for approaches in favour of restitution that understand the museum as a process and as an interrogative project. Whilst I'm in fundamental agreement with Rasul, I cannot help but think that we need yet more subtlety. Museums are houses of coloniality, but coloniality in the sense discussed, in the sense of European expansion, absorption and assimilation, was just one part of something bigger. The emergence of mechanistic materialism in the 17th century, the scientific revolution. It was the scientific revolution that denied traditional views that nature, nature was an organism, asserting alternatively that nature is a machine. Belief in the world as a machine composed of inanimate matter changed everything. In the mechanistic view, plants and animals are unconscious, unfeeling automata with no choices. It was also the mechanistic view that downplayed the senses in the face of rationality and experiential knowledge in the form of experiment. Feeling became the preserve of false knowledge found among natives, women, and children. Yet, at the same time, feeling was denied. Science permitted babies to be operated on with no anaesthetic into the 1980s because they had no feeling. Animals could and can be operated on because they have no feeling. As for natives, they were either childlike in their feelings brutish in their lack of sensibility, or romanticized for their stoicism, such that generations of Germans grew up being told as children that if they hurt themselves, they should remember that Indians feel no pain. They should be like Winnetou, Karl May's fictional Indian character, and make no fuss. And strangely, some of the finest minds of science, from the physicists Einstein, Bohr, Dirac, and Max Planck, to the mathematician Poincaré. They spoke of the best ideas coming to them as words or feelings or inspiration, as to so many artists and musicians. It was, we must remember, the scientific revolution that separated beauty from truth. Good theories and good music work when it's right. It has its own intrinsic coherence and beauty. It fits together, it feels right. Equally, as the architect Christopher Alexander observes, the mechanistic turn is signalled when ornament becomes something to be applied and is no longer something rising organically from its context. 
It's only in very recent times that scientists and social scientists are embracing a more fuzzy world in which the role of feeling and questions of consciousness are seriously being considered in ways that take account of intrinsic animacy and interconnection in life, a sentience that connects, a sentience that sounds very similar to that described by all manner of indigenous peoples and other peoples from oral cultures not stuffed with a mechanistic Western education. Only now is the yoke of Victorian science and a simplistic Darwinism starting to be seriously questioned. Don't get me wrong, science and education has some fabulous elements, and that's how we've come so far. But where are we now? In a world riven with climate and social disaster, we have to recognise that we took a wrong turn. Somewhere we need to backtrack. We need to pick up the path again and set out anew. Museums have traditionally been scientific spaces, cold spaces of disconnection, telling an account of a world split up into categories of study. They are a space where the epistemology is changing, but they struggle to move faster than their master, academia. Museum change requires a more convincing backtrack, uh, and as so does academia, to provide better directions and foundations. Only with a backtrack and intense interrogation of their epistemologies and purpose can academia and museums move forward. So this takes me to my last point. So what of sound archives? At Kwatu, I'm sitting on the edge of this museum change. Before giving this talk, I had the privilege of discussing what I was going to say with some of the San who are at Kwatu right now. And they, they have first-hand knowledge of life as recent hunter-gatherers. They also have first-hand knowledge of life in more urban contexts, but contexts not dominated by the hegemony of Western education. I'm pleased to say that, that they agreed with what I had to say here today, uh, and I think it gave them a, a fairly good summary. But ideally, it would, of course, be them here and not me. There is some irony in the fact that it's only once you plough your way right the way through the education system, at least beyond the PhD, that you get to a point where you have some space to reflect on the education system's inadequacies. As yet, the education system in Southern Africa has not served the San so well, and a handful undertake education up to master's degree, and as yet I know of no one amongst the San people with a PhD. I have a lot of respect for Rasool and other critics of museums and what they're saying. But as someone sitting right on the coalface, I can say that epistemological problem is a deep one. It is, of course, embedded in all who participate in our globalised literate world. And what it really means to operate outside of standard Western epistemology remains extremely poorly understood by the majority who work in academia. Or they know only too well, but continue in some sort of schizophrenic fashion to say one thing at work and do another thing at home, because that's what keeps them in work. You can't rock the boat too much. At Kwatu, we've built our centre on roots of co-curation and extensive and ongoing community participation. Was this neo-colonial? It was definitely post-colonial, and probably neo all sorts of things. But it was done with respect and with open hearts and minds. I think it's moved things forward, but you have to experience what we do rather than read about it. It involves how everyone acts, how they perform, the sorts of relationships they build with you while you're there. What we could not do setting up the centre was turn to an already educated San community, replete with scholars of museology, established in universities and working on the cutting edge of new museology. If we could have, I wouldn't be here at all. And that speaks of the reality of where we are, a reality we're helping to change by supporting opportunities in education, but the change is taking far longer than anyone first imagined. The key then, to my mind, is to support education that contextualises the mechanistic view and shifts the epistemology. Currently, we're in partnership with the British Museum, 
with the Pitt Rivers Museum of Oxford University and the Peabody Museum of Harvard University. We've supported the development of the first sound curator who is also working closely with the Zico in Cape Town. In setting up the museum, I've worked closely with the leading indigenous museum communities uh, as far as I could in Southern Africa and in the US in particular, uh, because I've actually found it very difficult to, um, to be involved, to get involved with communities in Southern Africa that were pushing uh, the interrogation in a direction that was valuable, or that certainly a direction that was taking people into good spaces. So I looked more broadly right the way across the world, and I tried to pull together the best that I could find. And the, there's a, a lot happening in the US, a lot happening in Australia and New Zealand in particular. Um, so it, going to the US, which is something I did a lot, I was interacting with people who have come out of the education system. They are in faculty positions. But it was really striking that even there, the museums were not, they were different. They've been called a museum with a difference. Um, but how different? So there's always a dialectic, a negotiation. And even in their context, in the US, it was easy for the critics to talk of neo-colonialism. Basul speaks of prioritizing process. And I too absolutely value and prioritize process. But process needs to manifest into something if visitors are to attend something, the museum. And visitors bring their own expectations. At our sound center, we've sought to capitalize on changing visitor feelings so that visitors can begin to empathize and then understand the different ways of San have of being in the world. Feeling lies at the heart of everything we do. In our way of the San building, we've prioritized sound as a mechanism of introducing information. We've also sought to avoid labels and descriptions, relying alternatively entirely on direct quotes from San community members about things that go together from their perspective. We've tried to nest themes as San nest them, not nested as a rigid scientific category ripe for proper analysis. The thing that we have not as yet managed to do is where you could possibly come in, and that's to develop a music exhibition. And there we go, straight away, we need to question the category, uh, music. But we have to begin somewhere, and the handle is useful. And it's important not to jettison things like that that can bring us into spaces and then open them up. Just yesterday, I was walking around uh, with my San colleagues, and I was saying, how do we deal with this word music? In Juntuanzi, do you have a word that sits like music? And we start saying, well, how do you use the word music? And I think I established that in Juntuanzi, they don't have a word that overlaps with music. Uh, they have different words for you do something. Uh, and if you do it with an instrument, then that's what you're doing. But you wouldn't talk about uh, thinking about music, uh, playing music in other contexts, singing music. It didn't work. Yet in Kung and Kuei, they said, well, yes, we have a word. And yes, it's just like music. But then you have to try and go in between the spaces. And you have to work out, is it the person in front of you that is describing it this way? Or does this, this language have a different context? Um, as I've indicated, music is essential to traditional San life. But this is in ways that are shifting and disappearing. So does this matter? How do we keep it alive? Should we keep it alive? And what are the risks of preserving it? But there are some tantalizing references to music that go back centuries in the San case. And indeed, if we embrace the Khoisan identity, it goes as far back as the Khoi Khoi flute players that greeted Vasco da Gama in 1497. Then we have spotty descriptions peppering the colonial records until William Birchall attempts to make a score of examples of San music in the early 1800s. Then, in the Blake and Lloyd archive from the end of the 19th century, are further descriptions. 
followed by the recordings of Perch and the intensive work of pioneering ethnomusicologist Percival Kirby, who published 10 articles and his 1934 book, The Musical Instrument of the Native Races of South Africa. He also deposited over 100 instruments of Khoisan origin right here. And then there was Winfred Hernley, a pioneer of South African anthropology, who left some wonderful pictures of Nama flute players, although her recordings were destroyed in the Witz fire of 1931. From the 1930s, there's then little that's done in a systematic way until we reach the work of Nicholas England as part of the Harvard Kalahari expeditions in the 1960s and the 1970s. After this, barring some small scale research initi initiatives, like the 1980s work of English musician John Brearley, we come to the 1993 and early 2000s work of the French musicologist Emmanuel Olivier, whose recordings are now being digitized by the British Sound Library. And, you, and a lot of them are online at the moment, and you can listen to them. After this, all sorts of people pop into the Kalahari to make their own recordings, alongside some organizations like SABC, working with certain sound communities to record traditional music. But the threads of all these endeavors lie all over the place. Can they be better worked with? What place do they have in an archive? There is then a rich corpus of material that could be made accessible in an archive. But how do we rethink it? How do we rethink the archive? How do we make it meaningful and interesting, particularly to younger people who are not aware of the contextual webs from which these recordings were extracted? And when they hear the instruments, the traditional instruments, they're competing in their heads with uh, things that have a, a much more um, energy, well, immediacy that they can relate to things that are louder, things that are perhaps easier to comprehend and embrace. Uh, it, I'm tempted, although it may say more about me than them, to say that the, the music they're listening to is more in their face. Uh, if I think of a, a sound person sitting in the grass, playing a piece of wood with a piece of wire and tapping it with a piece of grass, maybe with their mouth, maybe not, and the wind is blowing, that takes a different kind of presence than turning on a, you know, a television, a, a radio, and, and hearing things that are coming very, very plainly towards you. So the context is critical, but I can't help feeling that performance and participation perhaps will hold the key for the sort of archive that I'm thinking of, to the real engagement. Feelings and information need to flow. We do have plans for a mobile digital archive at Kwatu, but as useful as I think this will be, I think it's going to be empty unless we have instruments, unless we have people who are playing these instruments in place, working with the instruments, sharing the instruments, passing the instruments around, getting the wind moving again, connecting the people. So this is where I'd like to finish. And what I hope I've explained is that there's an opportunity here and it's a, something of a leap of faith. And I think it's a leap of faith we all have to take because nobody's been in these spaces before. We have to let go. We have to let go of what we think is demanded of us. We have to step into spaces with other people from very different backgrounds who are also letting go. And we have to bring it together to see what comes out. And there is an opportunity, literally up the road, an hour away, for us to do this. Uh, and I'm not sure where it can lead, um, but what I am sure is that an archive can be more uh, than it has been up until this moment. So maybe we are the uh, archive of the future, I don't know. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That, you know, what you say is ringing so, resonating so deeply with me. Um, it is so, so special to have you as a guest. And I would like to thank you for, for a wonderful, insightful opening up of worlds and, and potentialities. That, it, remarkable, absolutely remarkable. Um, before we open the, 
the floor for questions, I, I'd like to jump in very rudely and just make a remark. And I think you, you hit on a very important word or very important concept, namely the notion of letting go. And I see that in the context of, or the, uh, the context of, of musical composition. I can speak as a musical comp as a composer of music, musical comp composer. And I think that, in my opinion, the person, a person, a group of people who can contribute to your to your to your vision, um, they they would possess one important um, characteristic or character type: um, uh, the the approach or the the willingness to let go of the importance of what I do is important as a composer, and I need to be credited for the, the, the outcome. Um, and it's very interesting to me that there are precedents to this. Uh, the idea of, of open form in new music is very, very much um, a vehicle for, for creating music, composing music with this, <clears throat> within this framework. Um, and so, I mean, to you this may sound uh, completely abstract, and these are very rough thoughts, but it's something that struck me very deeply whilst you were speaking is that, yes, if we are willing to let go, if we're willing to, st to step back as creatives, as composers, um, then all of us benefit automatically. Um, yeah, so these are abstract thoughts, but you've moved me, really moved me. Thank you for that. No, no thank you, because that's... You know, maybe it's obvious now, but it wasn't obvious to me moments ago even, that if you think of the, the types of people I could go to to think about this mission, I mean, regardless of the content that it's a musical archive, a musical exhibition I'm talking about, um, it's not just an archive, it's, a, it's the music of the psalm. Uh, if, if I went to academia, if I went to uh, museum experts, who are the people who are sitting in there that know how to let go. Surely it is musicians. Yes. Or, I mean, perhaps you could, you could argue, um, you, know, you know, artists, um, poets. I think that's right. But there's something in that, that performance where you are completely vulnerable. Yes. Uh, and you're relying on, on that, I mean, the psalm would think of it as that wind inside you. To just it's just going to do its thing, and in some ways you're you're allowing yourself not to be judged, and that I think fits in with the psalm world where this egalit fiercely egalitarian, there isn't this judgment. Yes, uh, and that's part of this epistemological shift. Yes, yes. Th this we're not always saying you're right, you're wrong. Yeah, you know I can look it up and you're wrong. Right. That, that, doesn't, right. that doesn't fit. Right, right. Um, one last quick thought uh, ab about this is, is, is that for me, um, the, the sound composes me. I don't compose the music, and I allow this, the sound to compose me. And for me, that happened by accident many, many, many years ago. This, this mindset happened, uh, was, was initiated many years ago uh, purely by accident, but it, it has served me very well. Um, but I'm rambling about very subjective personal issues here. Um, I had to just jump in because, yeah, you resonate with me. The work that you do resonate with me um, in a very beautiful manner. So, so thank you for that from, from a personal point of view. From an institutional point of view, a big thank you as well. And shall we open the floor to, um, to anybody who's willing to fire off a question? William is in the uh, audience with us. William, would you mind stepping up, please? Because we are streaming live. Uh, are we getting enough sound from that? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Um, okay, so I'll just stay here instead of running up and running down and getting all short of breath. Um, really lovely work, Chris. I, I think you guys are doing some, some good, good stuff out there. I'm just wondering, just out of curiosity, do you know of the International Library for African Music? So I don't, no. Okay. So I think we need to have a, a slightly longer chat around that. Um, but we're basically one of the world's biggest sound archives for African music. Um, the U Tracy collection, which was conducted, yeah, 50s into the 70s and so on. But we established 70 years ago, exactly, the next year. Um, and I think we've been grappling with a lot of the questions that you are posing here and come up with certain solutions to certain extents. I don't think we have any of the right answers. But basically our director at this point, Lee Watkins, is thinking about the post-archive. 
that actually the, the notion of the archive is maybe one that we're starting to move away from, even in museology, right? Um, and so we, I mean, there's a lot of thinking in the spanning about the last decade or so. Um, we think about the archive without walls, for instance. We've done a lot of work on mobile, so satellite archives, thinking about archives as living in communities, in people, um, and so on. But one of the things that I think has worked the best, you know, the, um, that has yielded the best results in terms of not killing our archival material within our archive has been education. And it's something that you touched on in your presentation is that the educate, how important education curriculum, all that type of stuff is. And so I'm wondering just out of complete curiosity, do you, do you, do, does the, the archive where you're working at, do, do you have large scale education programs um, kind of being deployed? And if so, are those, like, are those educational programs for members of the various science communities or are they for visitors only? And how are you thinking about that educational design thing? Because I think that's ultimately where the answer lies for us. I mean, you know, we, we bring about 150 students through a program at ILAM every year. We learn to play the Uhari, where this music becomes alive and regenerated. And playing Hube, which is weirdly enough a very close instrument to, to some of the sound instruments. Um, so, but it's, it's through teaching students this music that the archive actually becomes sustainable as a preservation mechanism. So I was just wondering how those education uh, thinking is, is looking like at, at your archive. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I mean, it does point to the, point to the fact that um, scale. So in so, something like uh, Kwatu, there is essentially me. And um, there's, that's it in terms of finding out all these things and going through different processes. So this building up these bridges and, and learning about uh, other contexts is so, so important. And the archive, you know, I've, I've, I've been working around the archive, but it always gets put to the side because there's so much other more immediate things. And one of those at the moment is um, education. Uh, and then... It, with education, we've, I suppose in some ways, there's education projects that have been going on. So amongst the Zhengkwanzi, there's a village school education project, which has been going on for, I think, 20-something years. And that's the only one that really stands out. It's in the Zhengkwan language. Uh, and after, um, well, as they move into secondary school, then there's nothing that is particular to the psalm. In, in any context. So we've been trying to think of, of actually both contributing as much as we can to the national curriculums of South Africa and Namibia, uh, but also what's really required is a new kind of curriculum because the plowing people down the Western education route in somewhere like northern Namibia in, in Nainai, the Conservancy, when there's no jobs, um, there's, there's this, uh, the San have the highest dropout rates of any indigenous group in southern Africa. Uh, it's, it's just not taking people anywhere. So we're trying to rethink, maybe through formats that can be, uh, that are highly mobile, uh, they're not reliant on technology. But even school teachers, you know, there's, there's so little support for any school teachers. Um, they, they have minimal qualifications, uh, they struggle. Um, so it's such a big thing, that's the problem, the intervention. Um, and I've got networks um, that are potentially in, in place, um, but it's, it, as ever, it comes down to funding. Um, but we, it's something I would love to uh, develop um, in any, any ways that you could suggest. We've got some pamphlets, we'll send them along. <laughs> <laughs> but I think a longer discussion yeah. about sharing some work. I mean, we've, somebody like Radina McConaughey, for instance, has done a lot of work on rejigging uh, national curriculum around African music education that does not rely on the Western model of examination and, and so on. And so ILM has been really important, I think. And we checked out the whole Western degree kind of basically examination model in that program. Just 
know, we don't teach like that. <laughs> um, but I mean, I think there's, yeah, what I'm want, also wanting to say is to extend a partnership actually uh, on behalf of Rose University. So let's have some discussions, I think, especially around developing music exhibitions, sound exhibitions, definitely things to, to chat about. Yeah, yeah terrific. It remains for me to thank you, Chris, once again, and um, it it's really has been a very, very stimulating, um, thoughtful presentation. Thank you. Thank you.